Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. My name is Barbara Herring, and I would have so many hats to wear that I've decided to take them all off. My job is to facilitate this panel, and I would like to welcome our experts on the stage, on the floor. I will, I will present you briefly when I give you the floor the first time. Before the coffee break, our keynote speaker, as well as his respondent, mainly focused on the international level and on the UN, and we've learned a lot. We've learned less conflicts, but becoming more deadly. New security threats, not only terrorism, but also environmental issues, urbanization as a source, but maybe also as a chance for more security. A UN Security Council failing to address the right issues at the right time, not reflecting geopolitical realities anymore. And we learned that all institutions are, for the time being, paying particular attention to prevention. It has ev even been mentioned as being the leitmotif of this year. This panel now brings us back to Switzerland. And the question we have been asked to discuss is how should Switzerland respond to armed conflicts in the future? The way this question is formulated, has been formulated by the organizers, implies, takes it for granted, that Switzerland should respond to armed conflicts all over the world, and the question is where, under what conditions, how, how well organized, with what particular added value and impact, and these are the questions we are going to discuss on this panel. And our president reminded us that he would like to hear also new approaches compared to what Switzerland has been doing up to now. So I would like to start with you, Ambassador Christian Dusset, you are the director of the Geneva Center for Security Policy, based in Geneva, as it says. Before, you've been active in the defense sector, also in the intelligence sector. You've worked in Moscow, you worked in Prague. Having said that, you have a big experience on what Switzerland can do, could do. Where do you see a particular added value of Switzerland in responding to armed conflicts. Is there one and where? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Barbara. Good morning, good morning, good attack. Um, I would take the perspective of someone who worked a long time in Bern and now we work very differently and very for a different organization, not a government, for a non-profit and work in Geneva. And so I see Switzerland added a value on three uh, sector. The first sector or the first axis is on education and leadership. Education is a very powerful impact, but it's often undervalued. In Geneva, we host in our center more than 1,000 participants a year. They are all international professionals. They come from the private sector, they are diplomats, they are military officers. And what we try to bring them is to bring them new tools, new skills, but foremost, to challenge them. This is the point, to challenge them. They all come with a perspective, with a background, with a lot of experience. And we put them in a setting so they can be challenged. The second point linked to education is the leadership. Leadership is very important because before, as a center, we used to do courses on topical issues. It went for peace building to uh, a, uh, a cyber issues or to hard security issues, but the biggest impact is what you do when you go to a course in education, you go back to your organization and you want to think outside of the box, but you are back to a, a, an environment that is not conducive to innovation. So the leadership issue there is for all of us here to be courageous when we come back, when we are in our organization, just to have the courage to say to the superior, to the organization, there may be other ways to do things, maybe other ways to look at an issue. At the same time, the ability to be more resilient. More resilient is 
to come over and to go over a failure and to bounce back. It's not because we have something done something wrong and it's not worked that it cannot work in the future and we cannot perceive it. So the interlink between education and leadership is very important and the center that I'm leading was created. It was a bold act in 1995 of the Swiss Confederation, essentially the Ministry of Defense, to use the peace dividends, the budget they had in order to create something new uh, in Europe. The second axis the second axe is linked to new ideas and uh, new projects or new initiatives. And in Geneva, the Maison de la Paix, which is brand new, which hosts uh, more than 10 organizations, non-profit, uh, think tanks, uh, uh, universities, is there to bring value, to bring new ideas and new syn synergies. And we can see that and we can use that more as Switzerland as a tool in order to deal with the question we are dealing now. The, my last axis is linked more to uh, my previous position. As some of you may know, I was the, um, the head of the crisis center of the foreign ministry for four and a half years. And I had to, uh, to deal with uh, uh, many challenges in uh, uh, hostage taking, uh, earthquakes, uh, revolutions. Uh, some of the crises were one after the other, but most of the times they were simultaneous. So we talk here about interagency work, we talk about interdepartmental work, interorganization work. This was difficult. Around the table, you have all departments, all like agencies. But the most difficult thing was more how to be creative when you're faced with a novel situation. How to be creative to take two Swiss citizens out of Pakistan when they are held by the Taliban. To take care about the 2,000 citizens in Tokyo. And it's not around the table with the colleagues from the federal administration that you get the most creativity. Creativity and curiosity, they are muscle. And we have to spend more time in cultivating them. Because it's easy to, to say we have to think outside of the box. But the most important is really to act outside of the box. And on those three axes for Switzerland, the education and leadership issues, the question of um, new partnership uh, that we have in Geneva, for example, and the last point on innovation, we are still the most competitive and innovative nation in the world. And this is what we can bring also to different issues like the issues we are talking today. Thank, Thank you, you. May, may I add an, an additional question? Yeah. The leadership you're, you're, you're searching for and you're trying to, to train and teach your students, do, do, do you see this leadership within Swiss organizations, Swiss institutions? I can see from the outside now, because I can speak about it on a personal matter. Uh, um, there is a big difference between um, what you see in Bern in several departments and what you see in the private sector. Mm -hmm. The culture, every company, every organization has different culture. And here, we miss a little bit of creativity within the administration. We focus too much on the consultation process having everyone on board. But sometimes it will go us also to the Nokia trouble, the Nokia syndrome. When you focus too much on in the inside the company with a lot of committees and a lot of thinking how we can do better, you miss the point that Apple is starting a new iPhone and then Nokia, Nokia disappeared from the market. And we have an effort to do uh, in Switzerland to make sure that also the federal administration can bring it more creativity and more ideas from all levels. Mm -hmm. The leadership starts at the mm -hmm. basic level, the desk officer level and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. To you, Sidonia Gabriel, you're now project director of the Center for Peace Building COF at Swiss Peace, but your expertise is based both on your experience on the ground in Africa, in Asia, as well as your engagements with at the ministerial level and in NGOs. Um, based on this broad approach, do you have the impression Switzerland is prepared to give that kind of particular added value in responding to armed conflicts? Thank you very much for this very important question at a very important uh, moment in time. I would like to answer um, in two ways. And the first approach of how to uh, of answering this question is more related to the new approaches, and this question has come up. I mean, show us what now we have to do differently. 
And the second part will be more, much more related to the homework that we have to do in Switzerland in order to ensure the support for uh, the activities in conflict prevention and peace building. But let me start with the approaches. And I think at the core of all conflict prevention and peace building work is a value, a value that Switzerland stands for and that we, um, I think in the past years we have um, in a very successful way engaged, and that's the value uh, that we believe in dialogue and exchange, and we believe in political solutions uh, to conflicts. And um, this is not just a value that is out there, but it needs political commitment. Um, we're talking about Syria, talking about other uh, um, uh, conflicts. Uh, we see that uh, often there are actors, international and local actors, that do not necessarily believe in, in that dialogue approach and in this um, kind of more peace-building, more political uh, approach, finding political solutions. So there is, um, I think, a need for to keep up the political will uh, to this value. Um, maybe two or three other things that I think in the past few years in my practice um, have emerged. It's about the roles of the different actors. Often we expect from the UN the big solution. We have the, the big action plans, the UNDAF uh, frameworks uh, and how they are all called uh, in local context. Um, but the UN cannot solve it all. The civil society, we heard it this morning, um, yes, it's good to get them on board, it's good to be inclusive, but what does it mean in practice? In practice, it means that you get a diversity on board. You get different messages, you get different interests, and you get different opinions of how to solve these conflicts on board. We need to deal with this, and we need to create the spaces for these dialogue processes. And civil society, also the inclusion, cannot solve it all. Um, also in, in civil society, we have actors that are not necessarily supporting a, uh, a message of dialogue. So how do we deal with the actors that, are, that we call in our jargon the hard to reach? How do we get them on board? Another approach that I think is, is very important, and we, we spoke about it this morning with regards also to the Security Council um, uh, reforms um, and strengthening regional approaches. I think, and there Switzerland could have an added value, um, because we know we have worked for long in several contexts. We have a long-term engagement, we heard it about Afghanistan, um, in Mali, in other contexts. We are able, I think, and we have the capacity and the knowledge about local context, at least in some, uh, to follow the processes. So not only do project implementation or follow the big uh, programs that we have to align to, of course, um, of the national plans and the international plans, but to follow the process. Like in Mali, for instance, there is, an, there is a peace agreement right now, but the mediation process has to go on because all these nitty-gritty um, uh, details have to be negotiated still. And this, for me, is then also a question where, what is actually prevention and what is then a, um, a conflict uh, uh, resolution or transformation or peace building. I think sometimes the limits are very blurry and they, they are just because in the context we find both. We find uh, ongoing violence, but we find at the same time, like in Mali, we find areas, regions, where there is maybe just a latent conflict and it has not uh, broken out yet, or we can prevent a next conflict wave to break out. So it comes together. Um, yes, dialogue with the security sector, I think it's very important. Maybe we can talk la uh, later about it. Also a word on um, countering violent extremism. I think we need approaches to work on extremism, but we have to be very careful with the wording. We have to be very careful with, with, with judging who is the good guy and who is the bad guy. We again, and I think that's what Switzerland could stand for, a fine-grained analysis of the situation. And not just coming in and saying, okay, we support you because uh, you align with the values, the international values. No, we have to have this fine-grained uh, approach and analysis and I think there Switzerland can communicate with other actors. Let me just say two words about um, Switzerland, the homework. <laughs> um, there is a new message to Parliament, we have heard it. 
uh, that will go to Parliament actually next year. Um, but of course, it has already been consulted it has al and it's already in discussion. And I think that's a brilliant opportunity for all of us, so for civil society, for, the ac for academia, but also um, for the administration, for the private sector to discuss and to open the debate. What do we really want? Where do we want to go? What is ac actually the role of Switzerland? Let me mention two things um, of this message. Um, I think the first thing has already uh, also been said. Um, it provides a framework for an opportunity for more collaboration between the different sectors, between development, humanitarian aid, human security, peace building, and so on. So there is a chance for interconnectivity between these uh, fields. However, um, I don't know, the last uh, draft that we have seen when it, before it went to consultation with civil society has not much of really, does not say much where exactly strategically uh, these different sectors can come together. So how, for instance, in a context of humanitarian aid, can we do peace building? That would be a creative approach, right? Um, so where is the creativity and where is the strategic value of this interconnectivity if we start talking about working more together, which is very, very important, of course. The second um, remark that I would like to make on that is that all these instruments Switzerland has, so humanitarian aid, development, peace building, and so on, we need a very strong peace building goal in that. It's not to say, well, the others are less important. No, we, we have to have instruments of equal value that can work in partnership together in these local contexts. And um, we need to, yeah, we need to strengthen this. And in all these discussions around fragility and countering violent extremism and the new discussions that are coming up, we fear a little bit that the peace building goal is a little bit, uh, yeah, that is a little bit lost. Here, I think debate is necessary, debate with parliament. We actually also established a parliamentary group on peace building for that, just to, to give the space for debate, uh, the debate with the public, um, communication with the wider public. The peace building field has not done so much so far on that. Um, yes, so I think this is a role that also we can play, COF can contribute to, to provide these kind of spaces that are so important. So just to, to make the resume, I think new approaches, yes, but carefully. I think we have already also on the, on the topical areas, we have, Switzerland has a broad expertise, and I think we need to be clearer on who is doing what, when and how. How can we engage our approaches in niches and be very clear what our value, our core value of our engagement really entails politically. Um, so not necessarily new approaches, but we need to recalibrate and also, and I didn't speak about it yet, um, the question is then, is the administration, is civil society, is academia, is the private sector ready in, in a sense of the architecture, in the sense of the structures to be flexible, to, 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 to approach this also in a political way, to have the fine-grained analysis and all of that. So maybe we can come mm -hmm. to this later. Yes, Sidonia, you've, you've underlined the, uh, so to say, substantial experience Switzerland was able to build up during the last 10, 15 years of being involved on this level. Where do you see the particular expertise that Switzerland can provide? I think the expertise is on a topical level, as I said. So for instance, uh, the transitional justice dealing with the past was, was mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mediation, of course, is, is, is a big field. National dialogue, election support, 1325, uh, women, peace and security implementation. So on these levels, we have several uh, thematic areas where we are strong and where we also have, uh, in a sense of human resources and capacities that can, can provide technical expertise. But I think there is one thing that is maybe as important as that, um, and this is to provide these opportunities for dialogue, and not only for dialogue between conflict parties, but dialogue between the different levels, between civil society and the administration and academia and the private sector. 
And, and, and when we look at those who won the, the, the Nobel Prize in, Tun in, in Tunisia, I mean, that's exactly what they did. So they created this space, and I think these spaces, um, with the security situations in many contexts, these spaces, they reduce, and that is where um, I think Switzerland can provide at different levels um, these, these expertise. Thank you. Markus Kain, you're, you're, you're a senior fellow at the German Institute for International Security Affairs of the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik. And over the coffee break, we had a brief discussion on, on how the speed of consulting public administration is increasing these days in, in all fields. We do consulting for public administrations. With your research, do you, you do have a broad view of, of what is happening also in other countries. Would you subscribe to the strategy the two Swiss representatives have, have presented, namely really focusing on soft security, on dialogue, on education, on, on uh, new approaches, interagency partnerships? Would that be the right way for Switzerland, uh, in your view? Uh, thank you. First of all, I, I would like to thank you for the invitation. It's, a, it's an honor to be asked by a Swiss organization as a German to give advice to the Swiss community. Uh, uh, that's the reason why I feel a little uncomfortable to give advice to the Swiss community. I mean, who am I? Uh, and so, so just share your lessons learned <laughs> with us. And, and, uh, and on top of that, I'm, I, I'm paid to give advice to the German government, so it's a conflict of interest. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the SWP, we are, we are an, an foreign policy think tank by the uh, pay, uh, foreign, foreign and security policy think tank located in Berlin, and uh, we are paid by the German government. However, we are uh, independent, so it's a pleasure to criticize the German government every day and being paid for that. Um, okay, but to my point. Um, Actually, uh, I, would, I would start for, from a sl slightly different angle, but end with some similar conclusions. Um, regardless of the question what to do and how to do it, I would say everything which is um, fostering peace and stability within the context of the United Nations, uh, peace building and peacekeeping, I'm touching pe peacekeeping in a, in a minute, is appreciated from my point of view. So my advice to the Swiss government wouldn't be so much different from advice, my advice to the German government. And I start, I would start from a structure, structural change, and maybe my analysis would be different ten years compared to ten, ten compared to, to the situation ten years ago. I think what has been obvious that traditional, I would call them shaping powers, powers in the international system who um, took responsibility for the international order as we know it for sixty years, and we, on, the, on an international order we capitalized on. Uh, maybe not have disappeared from the international scene, but are in an introspective mode for a variety of reasons. The United States, it's about nation building at home. Um, to a different degree, the same applies to Great Britain. Uh, to a different degree, the same applies to France as well. Uh, so what we see is some kind of power vacuum or order vacuum in the international arena, which is filled by, or is supposed to be filled by other actors. And I'm not really sure if we will really be happy with the repercussions of that. So what the introspective mode of a variety of other actors means, in my view, is more responsibility for the European Union, or more maybe in a wider sense, for Europe. Not for the European Union as such, but more responsibility for Europe. That means for more responsibility for my government, but in a, in, in, a, in a sense, the same implications apply for Switzerland as well. Same, uh, second, arguments, the structural change, I mean, we, sh we should not f um, uh, forget that war has returned to Europe as well. As, I mean, we're not talking about only far f uh, uh, conflicts far away somewhere around the world. Um, now we're confronted with the uh, with a war in Europe, whatever you call it, intrastate war, interstate war, or an intrastate war in which there's an interstate war, that's not my point, but the overarching assumption of the last 25 years that peace, Europe is as at peace with itself simply does not hold anymore. Um, and that I think at least for Germany, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's in Switzerland the same case, has serious repercussions for domestic public opinion. Uh, security and stability, peace are simply not considered as givens 
uh, you have to do something for it. And maybe we should capitalize on that. I mean, that brings us back to your remark about what to do with the domestic scene. Uh, I think, n at least in Berlin, I would say, but maybe I'd be interested in your assessment to the Swiss scene, uh, the public opinion is now more open to security-related arguments than 20, 10, 20 years ago. Um, that brings me to my, uh, my focus on UN peacekeeping. Forgive me, I'm an international security guy. So UN peacekeeping, the classical approach, hasn't been mentioned so far. And here I would see um, also an added value. I mean, we have to see that the German contribution as well as, to the, as, well as the Swiss contribution to classical UN peacekeeping is, let's call it, uh, limited. Uh, uh, out of 106,000 police, so police, um, uh, police, and uh, police officers and uh, soldiers, there are 30 from Switzerland and 172 from Germany. Uh, that does not really satisfy the international community and does not reflect, I would say, the level of ambition both both countries uh, should pursue. Um, and I would see. Um, things might change, I would say. Uh, I see that a lot of European countries are, so to speak, rediscovering peacekeeping, classical peacekeeping, which also is reflected in the commitments of the UN Peacekeeping Count Council, or Peacekeeping Summit, U UN Peacekeeping Summit last week or the week before, in which we, had, uh, we have seen several commitments. Italy is contributing 1,100, the Netherlands in the recent month, more than 500, to, uh, especially to Mali, France, 800, and so on, and so on. Even the United Kingdom is redis rediscovering peacekeeping is and now is sending British soldiers to Ireland to be trained as peacekeepers. Pretty interesting. Um, therefore, I would see in the years to come a greater pressure, at least on my government, but I wouldn't be surprised if we would see more expectations to the Swiss government as well to contribute to classical UN peacekeeping. Uh, and mostly in the Berlin debates and the Berlin debates end with, oh, we can only contribute high-end capabilities, logistics, uh, air transport, intelligence. But at the end of the day, you might be confronted with a situation in UN peacekeeping where you need simply a battalion of infantry. Uh, and th I think this will guide us in the next years to come. In my view, a military integration, which we're going to see, or which we already see within the European Union, Polish units being part of the Bundeswehr, of the German armed forces, French uh, battalions being part of the German armed forces, and the other way around, probably will increase the pressure and will probably increase the number of military missions, uh, UN peacekeeping missions, and I would appreciate, but this is purely speculation, if we do not see um, as particularly national contributions, but EU contributions, which would then open up the perspective of S uh, Switzerland to participate in the uh, CSDP uh, framework and to build on, to build, uh, on the existing frameworks, um, partic having participated in Bosnia and in Kosovo, as far as I remember. Finally, and this is my final point uh, uh, as in foreign introduction, I just, uh, I just mentioned it, Finally, at the end of the day, it's the, qu the question of shaping the world, influencing the world versus administering the world. I think it's, uh, it has to do with the level of ambition Swiss has, Switzerland has in the international, uh, in the international um, uh, system um, and, the, and, and the, uh, the overarching goals of Swiss foreign policy. Uh, I'm, I'm currently encouraging um, uh, my government to shoulder more of the burdens of the international of international relations, and that does not necessarily mean military means alone. Please don't understand. Please don't uh, misunderstand uh, misunderstand me. But that at the end of the day might also include military means. Thank you. Thank you. You've you've um, talked about challenging your government. Would you also mean? challenging Switzerland to uh, be a little bit more ambitious in responding to the needs of the international um, community? I always appreciate foreign policy ambitions. I mean, we have a, when we talk about peacekeeping, peace building and all this stuff, I think we have a tendency to focus more 
and maybe unnecessarily on the limits, on the constraints. What, what can we do? What can we accomplish? What can't we do? But I mean, that brings us back to the debate about the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council being reformed is an important topic. You need the UN Security Council for use of force. You, ne you need the UN Security Council for uh, missions being deployed. However, who constrains my government to become, to become diplomatically engaged to settle the Syrian civil war? Um, so that would be a valuable foreign policy ambition in my view. And uh, maybe there are other topics as well um, in the, uh, which are of particular interest uh, for the Swiss government. But uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a question of self-perception, of self-identity, uh, if you're choosing to shape the world, to influence the world, or simply to suffer from the world. And I would, I would always vote for the first. Thank you. Let us, let us stick to this issue for a while. The, uh, the reports presented to the UN um, this year clearly underline the gap between the needs, the expectations, and, and, and the means the UN has to address and expresses the wish that um, countries would contribute stronger to bridge over this gap. Where do you see the possibilities of Switzerland doing this? And I will go back to uh, Sidonia first and then to, um, to yeah. you, Elsa. Um, so with regards to the needs and the means, and of course this is always linked to question of resources and, and so on. But I, 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 let, let me come back to, to the to the first, I think, and, and the foremost um, value that I, I was mentioning, and that's the political will. So the, for me, the question first is whether there is a political will to really engage more in the UN framework. And the second question for me would be if we would more engage also military missions, I mean, if this is at all mm. possible, um, what is the impact? Is that really the added value that Switzerland can bring to the table? Or is it much more in, 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 in what I said before? I mean, it sounds very harmless when you say, well, election support or transitional justice or uh, mediation, but it's not. It's not. And, um, and there is always this debate between, okay, can we, um, do we need to use military means or can we do uh, things through dialogue and expertise? And of course, the dialogue and expertise is always perceived as a soft uh, thing, but I think that's where also we have some communication to do about that it's not so soft as we always um, uh, pretend, and it's also not so technical as we always pretend. You've just mentioned the UN framework. Would that be the place where you would like to see more commitment of Switzerland, or or could it also be in other settings? I think it, it has to be in very diverse settings. And I think the UN framework is one that is very important and one we have been engaged on, on the policy level as well. And I think we have to continue to do this. But I think um, when we look at the private sector, uh, private sector engagement, we talked about it before. Um, but also there are other um, frameworks, regional frameworks uh, at the European Union level, at the level of, of other regional organizations. I think there we can still uh, continue to, to contribute or to, to provide uh, more expertise if, if that is what is also requested. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you. I agree with you, uh, Sidonia, and I believe that we know uh, the environment in Switzerland, a peacekeeping operation with soldiers under blue, uh, uh, under UN flag, uh, will not happen, probably. And thanks to that, uh, the government at the time was under a lot of pressure because it was the peace dividend, it was the 90s, uh, the Swiss defense budget was very large. And what you do with a large budget, with a lot of soldiers, and when, as a f defense minister, you travel over Europe, and all your colleagues say, but, you know, we are sending 1,000 peacekeepers to, uh, uh, to, to Bosnia, or we are in Africa, and where is Switzerland? And this is where uh, the, ministry of the Minister of Defense at the time, Adolf Foggy, said, why not create something different that Switzerland can be proud of, and this is why the centers in Geneva were created uh, at, at the time. So we need to be uh, re realistic in making the analysis where we can do and then have a, a strategic reserve and investing where we see that we can add a really add, added value. 
The example of uh, Mariana before, who said that the mediation unit at the UN is under need of finance, then we can back pay as a small country with a large financial means, we could have a very important impact that is that compensate for the lack of political will we have here uh, to invest in more robust operation, as you mentioned. Um, the, uh, you, Sidonia, as well as the ambassador, you have uh, underlined the fact that the new dispatch that is going to be presented to the parliament is for the first time, so to say, a, a overarching message, including um, development aid, including um, um, uh, human security, economic cooperation, and to other um, budget lines that had been proposed separately until now. To what extent do you hope that this um, overarching um, uh, project will contribute to working into more interdisciplinary and more interagency, uh, being also prepared to address interagency partnership at an international level? Well, I think we need first to do it at the national level. And that's already that um, uh, there are some, some um, challenges. And I think one of the challenges is just the pressure of implementation. So um, we have our uh, project frameworks or our program frameworks. We have to implement certain things. We have to have um, to, to, to achieve our objectives. And so there is at, at the more implementation level, there is this pressure that um, somehow takes away a little bit the energy and the, um, the, the, the strategic and creative thinking on looking at how then could we, that we are doing a very important program, uh, how could we work together. This is happening, and I have to say that it's happening at the, at the, le at the country level, at, at the regional level already. So um, because, why is that? Because we have to respond to the needs of the context. And again, I'm mentioning Mali, we can't respond in this context, just saying, well, we do the water, or we do the education, or we do only the peace building. No, we have to bring these together. So from a context logic, this works. But then um, how do we do this in our structures? And um, also, I think there is a need to have resources for this interconnectivity. The fact that all these different credit frameworks are in one document do not lead to more collaboration automatically. So there need to be incentives, there need to be resources to do this, and there needs to be spaces, again, I mean, I'm coming with this again very harmless uh, term, but there need to be spaces to discuss these issues. And then we can see how we can translate these experiences. And by the way, we are trying to do this on the level of civil society, um, where, uh, for instance, we are working on the UN Resolution 1325 National Action Plan, where we are looking with different civil society organizations on the ground, um, what is the difference that we can do with this tool of the, of the resolution, and we are trying to feed that back on the Swiss level and then on the international level. But that needs a little bit of effort and it needs a little bit of, a, of resources, extra resources. Would you share this, Christian? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, uh, extra no. resources are always yes. shared. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so let's go to Germany. How do you face this challenge of, of um, working across silos in order to be able to face the realities on the ground. Okay, I was already nodding my head. It's exactly the same problem. Um, everybody um, um, is aware that um, one perspective only uh, engagement in a given crisis, in a given region, in a given country is simply too simple. Um, it probably will fail. Uh, to focus only on the military in Afghanistan has failed or is about to fail to focus only on other elements, on um, supervising the inaction without other complementary elements probably will fail. So this is nothing new. So I would totally agree with you. It's not about reinventing the wheel another time. So it's about um, the, the implementing the political will to do it. Um, and sometimes it works um, to a certain degree uh, for reasons I cannot sometimes re not really assess at least in the German context, sometimes it simply doesn't work. 
uh, and uh, I think it's 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 nothing new to learn here. Uh, we're fully aware of uh, uh, of this uh, of this uh, consequences, terrible consequences. If we fail here, if we do not apply some kind of comprehensive approach, a whole of government approach, whatever you prefer, but at the end of the day, we are about to fail in various circumstances. Uh, add something that I believe interesting. You know, one of the main challenges that Russia is facing now is that they are lacking some expertise on the Middle East. And we face in the West expertise on Russia. So there is a point that we are relearning every time new things, but actually they are new things. They are not new things. We're just relearning something that we, have we should have learned in the past. And this is why we are launching, we have just launched uh, a few months ago, a history and policy making initiative in order to learn from failure and success in the past, in order to integrate them in the decision making in government, in international organization. So we, are stop, so we stop making the, 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 um, the mistakes we did. And we've lost a lot of uh, here in expertise on Russia and Switzerland and so on. We lost a lot and we have to regain it in order to re-engage in the dialogue and understand the different perspective. This is important. I believe the same thing happened in Germany. Absolutely. Just to extend the argument, uh, uh, we, we had in Germany, uh, for, 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 long, for decades after World War II, we had a tradition of certain regional centers at German universities, which covered um, the Middle East from language perspective, political science, history, economics, and so on and so on. Same goes for Central Eastern Europe, same, same applies to Russia. Uh, and other regions of the uh, of the international uh, of the world, and for a variety of reasons which do not have anything to do with foreign policy, but more with um, university policy, those um, centers have been either closed or be replaced by centers for the European Union. So actually, we have we had way more expertise 25 years ago, in my view, in Germany about certain regions, about certain countries than we have today, and the bizarre irony is that we about to set up a center for Russian studies nowadays after we have shut down all not all uh, I want to be fair a lot of academic centers dealing with Russia so exactly as you have said now we're rediscovering things we already knew before my last question to the three of us before we open up the floor also for the other participants of our conference. The three of you are in your current position, so to say experts from a little bit outside of the uh, administration. Sometimes I, I, I'm, I share the experience that as an, outsider, uh, as an outsider and as a consultant, you are the one that can bridge over from one department and one section to the other, and uh, thus foster this collaboration between departments. Uh, <laughs> I was in the middle of a uh, of, uh, very high stake, high pressure environment uh, with uh, a lot of crisis, and also that when, uh, when there is a need to uh, work together on specific issues that are high stakes or uh, uh, high pressure, time sensitive. Most of us in the administration were working very, uh, very well together, a lot of motivation. Sometimes we didn't have the skills. I talked about creativity before. This is something that we can improve. But looking from Geneva, looking at uh, my colleagues in Bern and also other colleagues in working in government, I believe we are under the syndrome of too busy to learn. We have so many uh, uh, meetings. We have so many conferences to attend. And we do not take the time to pause, to reflect, and to take in a year, four days, just to question ourselves, to question our way of working. And this could be a huge impact and, uh, in the way we work and we look at the world and make uh, a nice and creative contribution to um, peace building and the topic we are discussing today. Maybe to add to that, I think, um, yes, we can. We try to, to build the bridges and we try to be the messengers. And I think in a twofold way. Uh, the first way is, of course, between the different sectors uh, that I mentioned before, um, but then also between the different levels. So we have 
still, I mean, we operate on a on a mindset where we say, okay, there is the grassroots or the civil society, and then we have the top decision makers. Although this is not anymore uh, so uh, correct for many many contexts where. Uh, you have very, very quickly changing decision makers. Um, anyway, but we have these different levels and we have also the level of national policy of, 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 of and of international and um, global policy. And I think one of the key words here um, out of my experience is that we need to be translators. So it's not enough to just carry the message and say, well, you need to be more conflict sensitive or uh, you need to do this because most of the time when we change sector or level, the language and the discourse is totally different. The community that is working around this sector, the expert community, for instance, on a policy level is a totally different one from the expert consultant community that is working on a local conflict. So, um, I think, yes, we can be the messengers, but again, uh, we need time and, and a bit of uh, <laughs> brain also to, to make adequate translation work. And again, this is something that is just, I mean, that goes by itself. It's not, and, and it needs time and resources again, um, uh, but it, it needs a deep uh, jump <laughs> somehow into these levels and sectors and into the needs of the people that are working in there. My point would be, uh, we try and try, but um, um, uh, I mean, I want to be fair. I mean, the, 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 wa the waves of crises have approached the European coast faster than ever, or are, are approaching the European coast faster than ever. Um, I mean, um, although I appreciate the concept of prevention, I can fully understand guys at the German Chancellery, at the German Foreign Office saying, me, oh, oh you're totally right, the situation in Burundi, we have to be aware of that. But currently, we're coping with the Euro crisis, there was Greece, there's a refugee crisis, we have Ukraine, we do not, uh, we do not know what to do with Russia, and so on, and so on. So as much as I would appreciate a more thorough approach, more thorough thinking through, uh, I mean, let's be, let's be realistic, uh, things have sim simply changed, and I think that um, that applies to to the concept of prevention, prevention because you, you you started with the concept of prevention. I fully subscribe to the notion and the importance of um, uh, prevention, but I mean, for the time being, at least for some European capitals, I think we should be realistic that certain crises, certain uh, regions, certain countries simply do not draw the attention they would deserve with probably serious consequences next year or the year, uh, the, the year after. Thank you. With this, I would like to open up the panel and, and, and invite all participants f to ask your questions, to contribute with your statements to what and how could sh Switzerland contribute to response Yeah, I see one hand rising. I am Michel Monod from the International Fellowship of Reconciliation based in Alkmaar in Holland, but we have uh, some boards here in Switzerland. Um, my question is about education for peace. Uh, I heard that you look for creativity. And I, I wonder if you are aware of what civil society can bring for this creativity for peace. Uh, I, I know some organization um, who are dealing with alternative alternative to violence. Uh, for example, uh, nonviolent communication from Marshall Rosenberg is uh, very spread in civil society and maybe would be useful for also for governments. And I heard also of uh, restorative circles of Dominic Butter. And uh, this is a way to restore relations in a group in conflict. This, I think, would be also very, very useful. And uh, maybe you know also sociocracy of Gilles Charest from uh, Canada. Uh, this is a way to come to an agreement in a group in conflict on a special subject. You know? 
I think those are part of the creativity of civil society, which will be, would be very useful for government to use. I, I know you, you have a lot of problems, and uh, but uh, prevention is uh, always uh, difficult, but this creativity of civil society still could be proposed and, and used. And I saw on, on the table there some proposal from uh, women organization and different organization, my too, and I think this would be also useful for uh, Swiss government just to take advantage of all those different proposals made and, and flourish here in Switzerland. Thank you for sharing your experience and I will take a couple of questions, of, of, of other questions, additional questions before we go back to the panel. Yeah. My name is Benedict. I represent World Vision International. I used to be uh, the peace building unit of World Vision. I used to be based in the Congo and in the CAR. I have two questions. My question, the first question would be to the uh, to GSP, GCSP and uh, COF uh, with regard to uh, the place or the role of uh, Switzerland in terms of the fragile states. If I'm not mistaken, the Swiss government or the Swiss are still uh, dedicated to working to, for the promotion of efforts in uh, fragile states. Although this was not mentioned so much today, I, I would like to find out if there's a uh, direction that uh, the Swiss would like still to, uh, to move into, considering that places like Central African Republic are, uh, which are fragile states, but also are often the background of conflict. I think, uh, personally, I think that's a way to go in order, in particularly if we want to enflesh the prevention aspect of the work. So, so a particular like focus on fra fragile, fragile states. states yes. yeah. Considering, for example, the Busan Declaration on mm -hmm. peace building and state, uh, state building. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the, how, does, how, is, how far is Switzerland still engaged there? Yeah. My second question would be addressed to Dr. Uh, Marcus in terms of uh, what you mentioned about classical peacekeeping. Um, uh, what do you think would be needed to convince some of the European governments to engage in that form of peace, uh, peacekeeping, perhaps in a more innovative way, of course, because as the experience in the CAR where the, the European uh, peacekeeping forces would have had, would have performed a particular important role because they had uh, the respect of the population as compared to the French Sangaris or the UN uh, forces which are top down. But there was very little support for the for the renewal. So, uh, and that's why up to now we, we see con uh, continued crisis. So, uh, is that realistic? Your vision is it realistic, mm -hmm. or what would it uh, take to convince? What does some, it need? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. To to engage in a more innovative peacekeeping. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you. And the last one, because before we go back to the panel. Ambassador. Thank you. I, I want to come back to the question of, of, of the high level summit on peacekeeping and the renewed or a, an, a, an appearing paradigm shift of, of the NATO states to which UN peacekeeping versus previous coalitions. Um, it's true there was a high-level summit in New York, and it's true that there were a lot of pledges, but if you look at it precisely, the pledges for troops, for, f for foot, for feet on the ground, came from the traditional uh, troop contributors from, from the poorer countries, whilst uh, the non-traditional troop contributors emphasized high-value high assets. And there was, again, the underlying issue that every peace operation should have the political process in mind and, and whatever a political mission does uh, should enable a political process. So my question to you is, um, shouldn't we stop talking about um, robust interventions, especially robust interventions by the UN? Because the UN does not, has proved not to have the capacity for robust interventions. And as we've heard uh, from, uh, from the um, representative of uh, talking about Afghanistan, 
Robust interventions are very seldom successful. Um, um, there were successes in the past, but if you look at the non-successes or at the failures, they were much more relevant and much more tragic. So what can you as civil society and think tank repre representatives do to better explain what UN peacekeeping is about? UN peacekeeping troops are in on the ground with the consent of the receiving state. And a large portion of their mandate is to pr protect the civilian population, is the promotion of human rights, is the facilitation of a peace process. But I often think that this is not really uh, something that the larger public is aware of. Thank you. Let us just start with this last point, with the peacekeeping missions um, and, and, and their, the expectations uh, expressed, also the limits uh, Underlined, Markus. Um, uh, I, I think there are s several arguments on the table. I think, um, I mean, all analysis show that, regardless of individual failures, failures of UN peacekeeping operations compared to other operations, military operations, be it coalitions of the willing, be it NATO interventions, be it the framework of the European Union, they are more successful than others. So I think it's a valuable tool, and uh, the, one of the problems is that it's not fully that the European publics are not fully aware of that. Second point: so it's about effectiveness. Second, it's about legitimacy. I mean, uh, on the I don't have to repeat all the rhetorical commitments of European governments about the importance of the European uh, sorry of, of the United Nations as the. Um, sole forum for international peace and stability and security and so on and so on. I think the, the, the problem is that there's a, that we're confronted with the political will to, 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 uh, uh, to follow up with um, certain uh, with certain resources. I mean again, I want to be fair, my country gives I think one third no sorry, it's the third largest contributor to the United Nations. so there is some kind of commitment. Uh, I, I don't want to be unfair. However, I mean, the, the, the key, the key uh, task of the United Nations is to provide, to, to protect international security and stability. And I think what all we should do is to help the United Nations to do exactly that. And in my view, it's a bitter irony that on the one hand, Western governments, my government as well, is concerned about China becoming a responsible stakeholder in, it in, in the international community, but at the same time, the biggest true contributor of the, of the P5 is China. Not the UK, not France, not the US, not Russia, it's China, as far as I remember, followed by Russia maybe, but that's not the point here. The, 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 the key stakeholder in this regard is China, bitter irony. Robust interventions, um, may, maybe I used the word robust intervention, then I'm withdrawing robust. Um, uh, I think peacekeeping has changed, as we all know. I mean, MONUSCO looks totally different compared to, uh, or looks totally different uh, as other peacekeeping operations of the past. So we have, we're confronted with a complex pic uh, picture here. I could have never imagined 10 years ago a military operation mandated and led by the United Nations with drones uh, and all the advanced technologies. And that illustrates that maybe the traditional terms we use of robust or not robust uh, does, does, not, does not simply catch the reality we are confronted with. My point, but this is pretty trivial, however I think it's true, any military operation is only as good as the political purpose it serves and um, uh, in compared to other military interventions of other international organizations uh, I think the United Nations is um, very carefully complementing the military operations with the political process uh, which is sometimes the problem with NATO operations or maybe not regularly the problem but it has been the problem of NATO operations to a lesser degree EU operations another advantage of the UN peacekeeping operation system, and that's my key message to the European governments, but at the end of the day, I'm sharing your, let's call it skepticism. I mean, we have, uh, we have heard a lot of financial pledges in different contexts in the last 20, 20 years, we, and, and now we, we hear a lot of troop pledges, troop commitments. 
if this will really be followed by substantial contributions, we'll see. I fully agree with your analysis of the communication and I think really in the, the public awareness on um, all these different aspects that the UN is doing and the political process that um, also uh, it is supporting together with other actors um, that is not um, very well communicated and I think that's also on us, on the peace building community to, to, to do a better communication, to, do, to break it down also to, to understandable terms and not to, to, to remain in the UN jargon, which is also I think one of the obstacles. And I think also that this often the, the troops on the ground are seen as the solution and I think that's not uh, at all not the case and we need to start communicating um, about that. Um, at the same time, uh, working with Swiss civil society here, we have a very, very <laughs> limited impact when you look at the big UN, um, but there is opportunities to make inputs, to make contributions. I mean, the two uh, review processes uh, are opportunities. When I was in New York, they told me, well, you have to ask your member state to, and you have to pressure, <laughs> put pressure on your member state to put in the statements. And, um, but then in every member state, uh, the process of giving input is different and, and the questions asked are different. So we're still trying to find out how we can make the best of inputs and how also through our networks, um, not only the Swiss ones, but then also the European, the UN ones, how we, can, how we can build that. So there is also, I think, on the part of civil society, there is still some work, um, some work to do. If I make a few comments on this question and come back to and come to the question of creative uh, civil society. There is no one solution fits all, whatever the trouble you have to face. But as Michael Muller said before, there is a fantastic organization doing a great work. She's ba the organization based in Australia, the International um, um, Institute of Peace and Economics, who use evidence-based results on what works and what doesn't work, the positive peace concept. So we have a lot of to work on that. But also for us all here is to look at the situation from different angles. Put yourself as a head of a UN peacekeeping mission, put yourself as a head of a nonprofit, or as a diplomat or member of the civil society and look at the problem. How does it look from your own angle? This is my link to the, uh, the, the, the creativity of the civil society. You know, our center was created as an education, executive education center to uh, train the next generation of experts in arms control, disarmament after the fall of the Soviet Union. And at the time we had only diplomats and military officers. And until very recently, this was still the, ma the, the large part of our participants. And now we want to change it completely. We want to have in the classrooms every actor from journalist, grassroots organization, non-profit, international organization, diplomat, military officer, because this is where you can have a real impact. I'll give you one example. This is the only place in the world, and this is what is the added value of Switzerland, when you can have a US Air Force pilot sitting next to a major from DPRK. When next to the US uh, pilot, you have Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, and they are focusing on the same trouble. They are on the same team, and they have one task. They have just been appointed the next head of the UNHCR office in Amman. <laughs> and we have to find a solution. What are the priorities for the next six months? Mm -hmm. And they have two hours. Time pressure, and they have to present at the end. And Doctor Without Borders, the uh, squadron commander B-1 uh, strategic bomber US Air Force, a Chinese diplomat, they are all on the same table. And they have to come up with the same solution. And I can guarantee you, the pilot from the US Air Force will never see again UNHCR with the same eyes than flying uh, 36,000 uh, feet and being on the ground looking at the situation. And this is why it's extremely important to engage the civil society. But also for us, diplomats and, and military officers, to understand the world of social media. Twitter is so important. And my message here also today is uh, for the ministry where I come from to be more aggressive on social media, to use it more because I sense a little bit of reluctance in being on the, on, the seventh, on, the, on the eighth continent, because there is a life there and we have a lot of impact in civil society. Just look at the refugees, what they look for in Greece, they look for something to plug 
for the iPhone to be in contact with where they are. Maybe also to react on, on, on this and creativity of civil society. Um, well, when I was working for the UN in Liberia, I used a lot of civil society approaches. I mean, approaches that have been developed in peace community, peace education and community dialogue that then were taken up by, by the UN agencies because that's, that was the only way to, to, to do the work in the communities uh, that they were up to. So I think there is a permeability uh, uh, taking up um, the approaches and then also feeding back to civil society maybe some new ideas based on this work. Um, and I agree, of course, civil society can be very creative, um, but again, from my practical experience, um, we have to be careful when it comes to uh, competition for funding and when it comes to what I often say, uh, project society. <laughs> So when civil society becomes um, more of a implementer of projects that are given by donors for the sake of survival, um, and they lose a little bit their creativity and their thinking out of the box. And that's a phenomenon that unfortunately we see quite often and we don't see it only in Mali and in Liberia and in Sri Lanka, but we see it also in Switzerland. So this is something <laughs> that we have to, um, I think also in our communication and in our uh, debates and in the spaces for discussion that we have to take up and where we also have to engage uh, the donors in, in, in a constructive um, Dialogue. In other words, that's an advice you take for yourself as director of COF. Yeah. I would like to wrap up this panel with a last question to the three panelists. We are uh, soon be entering the next period of, of um, Switzerland's international cooperation, collaboration with the next message. Four years, more experience um, to gain, more lessons to learn and to be learned. Where would you like Switzerland uh, to be in four years regarding our question, namely responding to violent conflicts on an international scale? Four years from now. Christian, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. All my funding all my doesn't come from this uh, message. It was just passed, so I have less say. But... Um, um, at the end of the four year, when we look back at the result of uh, this message, I want to be proud. I want to be proud of the impact we've had because we have found new projects, because we have funded institutions, organizations, or, or ideas that have proven to have an impact. I, would to be, I want to look back and say, we make the right decisions, we were able to improvise on the way, we are not strict in the, uh, the lines that were uh, 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 set in the message as fixed lines, but we have made a concrete and powerful impact. Yeah. From my side, we talked a lot about creativity. I, I would add another word to that, which is courage, not to become non-professional, of course, in our engagements, but to take really the courage to, um, to decide where we want to go with this, with these instruments that we have at our disposal, the development aid, the humanitarian aid, the peace building, and so on. Um, so after four years, I hope that we can also be, in a sense, proud and say, well, we have taken the courage to make, to make decisions. And um, uh, from a personal point of view, this would also be a decision towards more flexibility to be able to follow processes. And following processes means also to take uh, to deal with failure. And I think that's something we have not discussed today or not, not um, maybe in depth, but I think in this work, I don't know, somebody said once, well, when you do good peace building work, if you have a, a success rate of 20%, then you're good because all the other 80% means that you have really tried and you have had um, uh, your failures that you have to take in these processes. So to take really the openness and the flexibility and also the political will to support, to seriously support, uh, to su seriously support this. Um, when it comes to, and we didn't talk about the, 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 the question on, 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 on fragile states and state building and peace building, the second thing that I, I would like to see is that we take a strong um, 
uh, impetus on peace building and state building so that we really address also, um, still address the root causes of conflicts, the root causes also of fragility that then could um, uh, Prov uh, provoke a, a relapse or a lapse into conflict. Um, at the same time, also stating that uh, peace building should not only take place in fragile uh, states. I mean, we see it, it's not, conflicts are all over and they are coming more and more um, also to Europe. But fragile states, yes, um, to respond to the question is still very much in and it's in the new message and it's very important because there is another stream coming on and that's the whole talk about um, countering violent extremism and as I said before I think there we have to be very careful we have to work on this and we have to engage in a dialogue but I think the right approach is really to take it from the state building to take it from the context needs and to work our way uh, through. Thank you Marcus looking from outside where would you like Switzerland to be in four years? Oh hmm. <laughs> Um, I mean, let, let me start fr from, from this angle. I mean, um, what I uh, consider really a serious development is that in a variety of, let's focus only in, on Euro in European countries, I see a tendency to shut off the country from the world. Given the complexities of the world, given the crises in the world, um, unlike 25 years ago, there's a general tendency to shut off from the world and not to shape the world. Um, it's pretty obvious in my country where the pub major public opinion poll last year should Germany engage more in the world or less. The over majority, 60.64% said we should withdraw from the world instead of engaging more with the world. And the interesting point was 20 years ago, it was exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, 63% were in favor of shaping the world instead of withdrawing from the world. And I see similar developments in France, in Great Britain, and so on. So my uh, wish to sw Swiss foreign policy would be, regardless of the details, to remain a responsible stakeholder and to be one of those powers in the international system, one of those countries who, with maybe limited resources, with a particular approach, um, pursues an approach of we want to be engaged, we want to be committed, and with our maybe limited resources and our maybe limited agenda, I don't know, we want to shape the world instead of suffering from all the world. And if that would be the Swiss agenda for the next four years, I would be happy. So would we. Let us thank the panel for trying to shape the world and for trying to continue. <laughs>